Some assembly required is about the head, the heart, and the mushy spaces in between, which invariably means facing adversity. You probably know about that, don't you? My name is Sean. I'm the host of Some Assembly Required, and this is episode 17. In fact, this episode is a slice of Some Assembly Required in that the original episode is titled Working on My Nerves with Sean Brooking. It was way back in the beginning of the podcast. I've clipped out a part for you to listen to now as we get closer to the end of the year and you're starting to feel frazzled, things trigger you that much faster, it could be that your nervous system is overloaded. So in the next 10 minutes, prepare to learn a little bit more about how you can self-regulate your nervous system. Feel free to go back and listen to the entire episode titled Working on My Nerves. And of course, if you like what you hear, remember to subscribe or follow the podcast on the player that you're currently listening on. We're going to jump into the episode and pick it up where Sean explains some of the emotions he was most likely feeling in his younger years and how he would mask that by pushing his body to the extreme through his favorite athletic endeavors. The next voice you hear is Sean Brooking. Definite like loss, loneliness. When you feel cluster of those emotions, the anger, the depression, the frustration, you know, you begin to start fighting yourself and fighting life in very different ways which are not nourishing, you know, everything becomes a competition then because of the pressure I was feeling of not having those deeper desires satisfied, those core human needs. And then the thing I was doing that I thought was going to help me and was a sanctuary, you know, it was telling you it was the beat down again. So all those big, strong emotions come with that, the loneliness, the fear, the loss. I mean, it was, I suspect, a lot of depression through my younger years, you know, it got to like dark places and it's, You know, I was doing the sport and it became something that I actually hurt myself in, which I learned later in life. You know, okay, I was doing that thing there to um, manage or express something that I wasn't willing to get support on or how to ask for support. It's, it's a lot of strong emotions labeled with that. Yeah. Sean earned a sports science qualification with an honors degree in human performance. He's now a specialist personal trainer in London, where he's fully immersed in the fascinating realm of somatic coaching for regenerative energy, freedom of movement, and authentic living. It was through his tertiary education and on-the-job experience that Sean started to analyze how our bodies might hold stress and tension. I was kind of ending my third and fourth year at Stellenbosch. And then I was working in the high performance lab. So now I'm getting a mirror view of the performance world as my body's breaking down. And then basically witnessing how not so healthy the performance world is. We patch up the athletes, get them on the field, get up and go, right? It's just a patch up job. We've got to keep the machine moving. So we still view the body in this mechanistic way. We treat the parts. Hopefully the whole gets better. You know, then you can perform, you can do your life. Same thing. You get injured, you go to the physio. We look at that site of injury. There are changes happening where we look at the whole person and we look at the compensations because of that injury on the one side of the body. But I wasn't convinced that that was the only thing. So the harder, faster, stronger thing, right? That's what I learned in kind of the athlete realm isn't really healthy. When I came to the UK, I started working in clinics and I was doing a lot of rehab, manual therapy, hands-on work. When people were coming into the clinic, you know, the other side of the, the coin here was that people bounce out of the clinic with no pain. They're feeling good. Then we give them the exercises and the movements to do that are going to help them, but then they don't do them. So I was like, okay, what's about this thing now that we don't want to help ourselves? So there must be something about behavior. I'm ashamed to say that I fall into this category of patient. I do leave a physio with the best intentions of doing the rehab exercises. I even make a follow-up appointment soon after, forcing myself to follow through with those intentions. But it just doesn't happen. When I was doing the manual therapy, hands-on work, there was another kind of light bulb moment where people were talking about their life and under my hands, slowly I started feeling different things of, through their tissues. So this one guy was chatting to me about his relationships at work and he hated his boss. Like he walks in the room and I mean, his shoulder would just come up. I would see all this tension come back in and he kept coming to me for this right shoulder issue. So four sessions in, I was a young therapist at the time, being a direct South African. I said, well, it doesn't sound like you have a good relationship with your boss. You should change jobs. (laughs) So he was shocked and he did come back a year later. (laughs) I looked at him and I said, oh, you look better. I was like, is your shoulder better? And he said, yes. I was like, you quit your job, didn't you? And he said, yes. I was like, okay. So there's something here in how we relate to others 
that affects our body on an emotional level. So there's some psycho-emotional interaction behaviorally and how we're training our bodies that isn't all kind of fitting into place here. As Sean makes this discovery, I'm reminded that I too am only just scraping the surface of what the body remembers. And just saying that reminds me of a book, a New York Times bestseller, in fact, called The Body Keeps the Score. You may have heard of it. Bessel van der Kolk is the psychiatrist, author, and researcher. He's an educator based in the U.S. Uh, that put the book together. And his research has primarily been in the area of post-traumatic stress. Maybe it's something you want to consider reading yourself. Anyway, back to the story. So that's when I started looking at more of brain-based training. So I looked at the neuroscience of how we actually change, so neuroplasticity. So we can change behaviors through emotional regulation, how we relate to ourselves, how we relate to others. And then the somatics came in because that was a more of a, a way into how the conversation might be structured you know, in a coaching dynamic, but it's still keeping the mind-body access front and center. Somatic therapy emphasizes helping patients develop resources within themselves in order to self-regulate their emotions or to move out of that fight-flight-freeze response and into a higher functioning mode where they can think more clearly. So we're not leaving any of our parts out of the room like we would with the athlete world or the rehab world, you know, treat the parts. I'm looking at the entirety of this being. It's how they're functioning within their life, how they're relating to themselves, first of all, and their body, right? We usually relate to the body as when we've got an injury, let's just say for a simple example, this shoulder, that thing, very dissociative. No wonder you're fighting yourself or your pain regulation is going up when you're talking to yourself that way. And then you layer your relationships on the outside world on top of that. And then you put your work life on top of that. Maybe you got kids. And then just the stress of life moving through day to day. It's a whole life, whole person approach uh, using many modalities with a strong neuroscience background because the neuroscience was quite a big eye-opener for me. Even in a sports science world or exercise science world, we're still learning about the brain and the nervous system, which controls everything. I'm sure by now you will have listened to the very first episode of Some Assembly Required. In it, you'll learn that I have a daughter that's got special needs. One of the things I didn't share in that episode is that the very first neurologist we saw told us that Zoe's a plane we cannot fix, close quote. And if I'm honest, I think the audacity of his comment, while it's an educated guess, has sparked my fascination with neuroplasticity. That nervous system signal needs to be well-oiled. And as we're learning this, we're also coming to terms with the fact that our body does hold tension. It's holding pressure. So for us to improve the signal speed and improve our abilities to do certain things, it's almost like we need to unclog our nervous system. Does that make sense? Yes, 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 yes. If we look at the nervous system like a, a traffic light, so red zone, amber zone, green zone. Green zone is where we want to function most of the time. We call it the rest and digest phase. Nervous system is calm. We can relate well. Our digestive system is nice and soothed. You know, there's not too much stress environmentally. You can think creatively. It's a really good place to be. Generally in life, we function between amber and green. Amber is probably where I'd say I'm, I'm now at. I'm quite here. I'm present. I've got to be alert. I've got to figure out what I'm saying. Uh, there's a little bit of muscle tension in my body. There's a little bit of nerves, you know, all those things, but I can perform. We call that kind of the function stage. When we get into the red zone, that's when we start to kind of push the limit on, you know, if we live in the red zone too long, that's where it becomes a problem health wise, because we might have strong emotions there, frustration, anger, also kind of more not so useful, depression, sadness, loneliness, but it's still a pressure on the nervous system, lots of tension in your body, but you wouldn't want to have an argument with the person in the red zone, right? They're screaming, they're shouting, they're not very relatable. You also could be in the red zone with yourself. Yeah, really not so useful inner self-talk, right? That could push you into that red zone. I remember the peak of my burnout, end of 2019, Beginning 2020, sensorily, everything was overwhelming, whether it be the quality of the light or the temperature of the room, every sound, whether it be a bird tweeting in the distance, dogs barking upstairs, or somebody dropping a spoon in the kitchen right in front of me. 
It all felt like it was right up in my face. And that is not a healthy space to be. So if I look back at my childhood, there was a lot of pressure there, things I wasn't addressing, not so useful emotions, and things I wasn't really dealing with up in my head and not allowing to express, there was a lot of pressure. Then I go and do the physical thing, more pressure. Performance, competition, more pressure. University, more pressure. Now I just look back and think, wow, if I knew this then and I could stay in green and amber zone, how much better would have I competed? I would have thought much more clearly. You know, I probably would have got better results on my test papers. All of those things. When we look at it that way, it's like if that baseline functioning and we're always living in the red zone, we might not be doing our best things or achieving the things we want to achieve or get stuck in loops of, you know, those not so helpful conversations with ourselves or our partner. The brain and the nervous system have to be front and center with everything. To describe the nervous system in a very simple way, which is it's quite complex, if you look at that traffic light system, you know, ask yourself what zone you're in before you go into anything. I think is the best thing. I just take a moment to pause and just check in and like, what zone am I in? What do I need? You know, exercise might not be the best choice because I'm in my red zone. And you'd be surprised how quickly you can get out of your red zone if you learn techniques to regulate yourself back to baseline. And then you can go, you can go to the gym straight away then, right? Your nervous system works at lightning speed, taking that opportunity to harness that power. Isn't that fascinating to think that our nervous system responds so quickly that we can take ourselves from the red zone to the amber and all the way down to the green zone in just a few moments. You know, imagine having all of yourself at the party, not just all your best pieces of yourself at the party, not just, you know, the cognitive. And that's it for this slice of some assembly required. One last reminder, of course, that the original episode can be found in the playlist. It's called Working on My Nerves with Sean Brooking. Plus, there's a bonus episode with Sean that involves a daily practice called swiping to help you self-regulate your nervous system. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with anyone that might also enjoy it and find value in it. If you're on social media, keep an eye out for the Some Assembly Required accounts on Instagram, on YouTube, and most recently on TikTok too. And remember to follow Some Assembly Required on your favorite podcast listening app. As a one-man show, I would really appreciate it if you gave the podcast a five-star rating on your preferred podcast platform. Thank you for listening to Some Assembly Required, all about the head, the heart, and dealing with adversity. My name is Sean Lutz, and I look forward to speaking to you again next time.